y'all, Scott here. I have started a new health initiative to bring awareness to plastic deficiency. I was diagnosed with it 22 words ago and would like to open things up for people willing to donate to the cause. I was also diagnosed with live plastic deficiency to get a free Wii Zapper syndrome. The Nintendo Wii, one of the best-selling consoles of all time. Its mission? Appeal to people outside of the gaming crowd with games and controllers that were simple and intuitive. First everybody, then the world. For a while there, everybody's favorite pastime was buying a Wii and it was all because of its controller. The Wii Remote had motion sensing capabilities which made things drastically easier for more casual consumers to understand. You didn't have to press A in the next followed up with a bachelor's degree to swing the baseball bat, you just swung the baseball bat. The Wii was a success due to how simple it was. So why was there so much sh you could buy for it? Oh my god, it's a Wii owner, sir! Would you buy any of this? Oh, I'll buy f***ing anything. Releasing in 2006, the Wii was a tremendous hit, specifically with the outsiders. Yeah, those people. People who didn't normally play video games. They had a lot of fun with games like Wii Sports and Wii Play. They were simple to control and easy to understand, primarily because the controls for the games were incredibly intuitive due to them mimicking real-life motions. It felt like you were actually golfing or swinging a tennis racket or killing a duck. But we can't just stop at the liability wand, we can make this so much more realistic. We can put it in a wheel, put it in a gun, put it in a kid. The Wii Remote was pretty much a blank slate, you can do anything with it. How do you make things more immersive? By doing this. Accessories for video game platforms are an inevitability, extra doodads to make your experience that much better with a question mark. Some are completely optional, some may be required for certain games, and all are too damn much. I would argue the Wii was the system with the most accessories ever. Just the fact you could swivel the controller and it was a simple rectangle meant you could pop this brick in anything for maximum unnecessary. Whether accessories were made by Nintendo themselves, licensed by Nintendo to carry the Wii branding, or were f***ing garbage, any way you slice it, there were a ton of accessories for the Wii. It would be nearly impossible to compile them all together, but that's exactly what Noah said. I did my best, and here we have the world of... So the Wii was a 2006 party platter. In the box, you got a stand, a stand for the stand, AV cables, power adapter, sensor bar, Wii remote with a jacket, nunchuck, and a copy of Wii Sports. <laughs> Who's hungry for more? I guess you could consider the nunchuck to be an accessory. Plug it in the bottom of the Wii remote for games that support it. Boom, you just gained a thumbstick. That's all it takes. We have two more buttons and another excuse for motion controls. The nunchuck is a necessary evil with life. You need it for a good chunk of the Wii library, but I don't know many strictly nunchuck fans. It has absolutely zero weight to it. Its motion controls are 100% not as good or responsive as the Wii remote itself, and while I didn't have much of an issue with the cord, many did and felt it would get in the way of what once was a truly wireless experience. I'm surprised not that many Wii games supported using dual Wii remotes as an option. You'd have to plug the nunchuck into this here port, which offered endless opportunities. So many other Wii controllers use this, there's never been this many possibilities with just one hole. The Wii Classic controllers were used by those too stubborn to convert. Some games offered support for them, you'd plug them into the bottom of the Wii remote and you'd just use them like any other controller. They were primarily created to control classic games you'd download from the Wii Shop channel, hence why the first model looked so similar to a Super Nintendo controller. In fact, only available in Japan through the Club Nintendo service was a legitimate Super Famicom controller for the Wii. It works just like a classic controller, but it doesn't have the sticks and tic-tac growths. They later released an update the Classic Controller Pro, firmly drawing a line between people who use the Classic Controller and people who cared. I love when the word Pro is used for products like this. I can't use this, I'm a professional. A tweaked Classic Controller with some button placement adjustments, and of course something to keep your palms busy. These were nice little extra purchases back then. They may not have had rumble or motion controls, and they were always tethered to the Wii Remote, but I never personally had an issue with that. All those downsides contributed to an extremely affordable price. Only around 20 bones for these controllers made them a bit of a no-brainer. Plus, they connected to the Wii Remote. You know what doesn't connect to the Wii Remote? Satan, see, these things are amazing. But see, there's even more to this port. Contrary to popular belief, the Wii Remote wasn't perfect. It's okay, who cares about religion anyways? Many would point to the initial trailers for the console where people were using the controllers in exaggerated ways, like jumping behind the couch to take cover. See, the Wii Remote needed more oomph if it was ever going to come close to detecting more precise hand movements like that. So alongside the game Wii Sports Resort, Nintendo unleashed their next Wii Remote add-on. Let me check my pocket. Oh yeah, I got one, the Motion Plus. The Wii Motion Plus is attached to the bottom of the Wii Remote and added a gyroscope to further enhance the Wii Remote's motion sensing capabilities. Like, the Wii Remote did the job before this, but that's all you could really say about it. Motion Plus actually read the precise positioning of your hand. It just comes with the downside of having to recalibrate the controller from time to time. But it does read movements far more accurately, and it came with a longer Wii Remote jacket too. I'm welcome. This technology was quickly added into future Wii Remotes sold, the Wii Remote Plus, which these are definitely the go-to way 
to experience Motion Plus. You'd constantly have to rip off the adapter to use it with other accessories, and this thing was complicated as all hell considering Nintendo included a Wii Motion Plus how-to video with all games they released that supported it. Nintendo, why didn't you include a how to click on the Wii Motion Plus video video? I have no damn clue what I'm doing here. A good handful of Wii games either offered Motion Plus support or 100% required it, so thank god they incorporated that technology into future Wii remotes. This has gone through the laundry five too many times. Here's the thing though, Motion Plus is great, good for it, but it isn't wheel shaped enough. That's exactly why Nintendo created the Wii Wheel, bundled in with Mario Kart Wii Plastic, it's plastic. It doesn't give the Wii Remote any additional features or benefits outside of feeling more steering wheel-like. It does have a cutout for the IR pointer and an extension for the B button, but other than that, there is nothing the Wii Wheel offers that tape doesn't. Back in 2008, this was kinda cool because like I said, what made the Wii Remote popular were the games that mimicked real life. Throw the bowling ball, slide, or poultry. This felt like you were sorta of really driving, but it's a wildly unnecessary purchase considering it's just a holder for the remote. All all it does is make you feel like you're licensed and it gets suspended. It may be just plastic, but that never stopped publishers from adding compatible with Wii Wheel to their game boxes. Oh yes, it's compatible with the Wii Wheel! Is it also compatible with the concept of love? But that brings us to the ultimate form of plastic. See, Wii games taught me what it's like to play golf. They also taught me what it's like to kill. The Wii Zapper! Obviously the name is a throwback to the NES Zapper, probably also because they don't really like to label things as a gun. For only $20 you got literally the only thing that matters and this looks like a gun shed its skin. Link's crossbow training was bundled in with all zappers and is a simple high score based game with a handful of levels based on the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. You go through three different types of stages, ones where you're just blasting targets and on rail sections, others where you have to stand your ground and defeat the enemies before they get to you, and full on third person shooting sections where you have full control of Link. It's incredibly short, you can get through the entire thing in roughly 45 minutes, but it's legitimately fun to try and go for high scores. It's interesting Nintendo opted for a Zelda themed pack-in game for the Zapper, considering this isn't the first franchise I think of when the term Zap is brought up. Also, Nintendo's pack-in titles for the Wii were generally the generic me-based games, but to be fair, this is a weapon. This is already mostly aimed towards the core Wii owner, not the people who bought Wii Play, more so the people who bought Elevates. So I think it just made sense to utilize one of their more mature-oriented franchises. Which just makes me wonder why they didn't do a Metroid Prime shooting range pack-in, instead that would have made slightly more sense. But that's just the game. What about the Zapper? I hate it. I never liked this thing. If we look at the Wii Wheel, that's as simple as Wii accessories get. Boom, just wasted 20 bucks. The Wii Zapper isn't as complicated as a science project, but comparative to other Wii accessories, it is. Put the Wii remote here, and then the nunchuck here, open up this flap, close it shut, take off the back cover, wrap the cord around, have it extend out here, put the cover back on, plug into Wii Remote, why did I do this? By the time I finish setting this up, it fully sets in that no game needs the Wii Zapper. It's just a shell for the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, and to me it makes things slightly more awkward when I play first person shooters with it. Instead of being able to hold the Nunchuck independently and move the Wii Remote by itself, these two things are now conjoined, you have to move everything to aim and shoot. Sure, it feels a bit more gun-like, but not enough to be a huge boost to immersion. Like the Wii Wheel looks and feels like a wheel, the Wii Zapper is as gun-like as a water gun. This has way too much work required for what ends up being just an okay experience at best. I would always prefer to just use the vanilla Wii Remote and Nunchuck setup. It's more more comfortable this way and doesn't require any preparation. Which that was the mentality behind We Speak, Nintendo's solution to voice chat online. No setup, just do it. This was released alongside Animal Crossing City Folk. You plug it into one of the USB ports on the Wii, set it on top of the sensor bar, and talk to your friends or at the very least try to. See, the concept behind Wii Speak was great at the time. You wouldn't have to wear headphones with a mic, no wires, just talk to your TV and hear your friends talk back. It felt like a very Wii way to do voice chat. The problem was, that microphone was right next to your TV's speakers, so while it would pick up your voice, it would also pick up the game's audio and your friend's voice and their game's audio non-stop echoing, so it was just my favorite definition of not good. They may have said it was designed to mute the game audio or echoes, but this is the same company who said, let's make the Wii Speak. You can download the Wii Speak channel alongside it, coming in December. It doesn't work anymore, but it would allow you to chat with your friends. This was pretty much the extent of Wii Speak's use. It was compatible with a few other games, whether it was for online voice chat or just to give certain games microphone support. A Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy let you record victory and defeat catchphrases while also letting you speak your answers. It works about as good as I'd say it does. It doesn't. But hey, the Wii Speak is worth it for recording victory and defeat sounds in Wheel of Fortune alone. Got it. Wii Speak was one of Nintendo's most underutilized accessories for the Wii. It felt like they wanted it to be used for so much more, but they just kind of made it for Animal Crossing and then pissed out. Look at all these Wii Speak compatible games. I never thought I'd have to squint reading a Wikipedia article. Well, I can at least say this wasn't the case for the Wii Balance Board. Bundled in with Wii Fit, it was a skill that actively insulted you. This definitely got much more support, and justifiably so. I mean, this allowed you to use your entire body to control a game, not just your hands. Whether it worked properly or not, 
it was on a case-by-case -case basis. Some games it actually worked as advertised, others it wasn't responsive enough or it was too responsive enough. The main games I played with this were obviously Wii Fit and its standalone expansion Wii Fit Plus. It made good use of the board, though sometimes these games felt more like a good use of the board rather than a good way to get in shape. Quite a few games supported the balance board, but they mostly boiled down to other fitness and sports titles and Tetris. While the Wii itself was a very health-conscious machine promoting so much not sitting, the balance board truly branded it as gaming Weight Watchers. And Nintendo wanted to do even more health-related jargon on the console, which brings us to the Wii Vitality Sensor. It released! Gotcha! At E3 2009, Nintendo fans' worst nightmare was revealed. Ah! Much like the Nunchuck or Wii Classic controllers, this would plug into the bottom of the Wii remote. You'd then stick a finger into it and it would read your heartbeat. People lost their shit. This was announced at a time many hardcore fans were getting tired of Nintendo's greater focus on casual and health-based initiatives, and when they revealed something you'd find in hospice, well, that's kind of hard to get excited over. Nintendo stated that in 2010, they would showcase games that utilized the accessory. Instead, they went for a different tactic and canceled it four years later. No games, no pricing, no release window. The reveal at E3 2009 was pretty much all we saw of the Vitality Sensor. It was said to focus on getting users to relax by reading their heartbeat. The only true experience I thought of that would have benefited from this thing was a horror game. The the idea of a horror game that knows when you're scared has so much potential. I like to think the Wii Vitality Sensor was going to be sort of cool, I did find the concept behind it to be intriguing. The problem was, during product testing, while well, Nintendo got it to work with 90% of their focus group, they wanted it to be at 100%. And that is pretty much all of the official Nintendo-made accessories for the Wii. Of course, we couldn't forget about the Nintendo LAN adapter or the Nintendo Wi-Fi USB connector for playing online. We couldn't. But that's only half the story with Wii accessories. See, if you were a company that noticed Nintendo stuffing Wii remotes into random pieces of plastic, well, let's just say lust takes many forms. Yes, what was Nintendo too scared to make themselves? See, many companies looked at Nintendo cramming this thing into God knows what and said, we can do that too. That's not to say these other companies made pure garbage. I mean, you can't have not garbage if pure garbage doesn't exist. It has value. Some third-party accessories were actually pretty cool, useful, or even got the blessing from Nintendo themselves. Such as this wireless sensor bar produced by Rocketfish Gaming, but officially licensed by Nintendo. All you have to do is throw four AAA batteries in, realize the person you bought this from left decade-old batteries in it, get battery corrosion on your hands, and play Fortune Street. But what if I don't want chemical burns and I just want to look like a f***ing idiot. Well, there's the headbanger in-game chat headset for the Wii, another one officially licensed by Nintendo. Nintendo looked at this and went, f*** it. Yeah, Modern Warfare 3 didn't support the Wii speak, I can't believe it either. So this worked with Black Ops and Modern Warfare 3 and Conduit 2, I had me at so. It's just a simple USB headset, it doesn't work with Wii speak games, don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. The games like Black Ops on Wii are still online, so let's give it a shot. My Wii U froze, but my biggest concern is I can't try out the headset. We got loads of stands for the system, games, controllers, all of that. I used to have this media tower right here, but what I have in my hands is an ashtray. I don't know who made this or when it came out, but it has the official Wii logo on it. It has spots for the console, some games, some remotes, but this looks like a pill organizer to me. So the Wii with the stand doesn't fit, only the Wii without the stand fits, and that barely fits. The Wii has these little nubs on the side that keeps it from sliding in. The games aren't snug at all, and I guess I'm supposed to put my nunchuck here? I hate this. I feel like my Wii is gonna fall at any moment. Maybe they want you to put it like this. But what I'm here for are the third party controllers, like this Tatsunoko vs. Capcom fight stick. I always wanted this, primarily for old arcade games I downloaded from the Wii Shop channel. There was only one way to play NES Pac Man, not, nah, but this stick would have made it way more fun. I always wanted this fight stick for anything but Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. Tatsunoko vs. Capcom is a great game, but I don't know what those first three words mean. This is a legitimate quality arcade stick. It has superb weight to it, and it plugs into the Wii remote like a classic controller. Tons of Wii controllers use the remote as a means to power the devices as well as keep them wireless, which was incredibly smart. It helped keep costs down. Why cram all that technology into these things when the Wii remote can do all the heavy lifting? First thing that comes to mind are the music game peripherals. Guitar Hero and Rock Band instruments, the DJ Hero turntable, just pop a Wii remote in and you're in business. And speaking of music game peripherals, Dance Dance Revolution mats. You'd plug these into the GameCube ports on the original model. Somehow I was expecting this to plug into the Wii remote. But see, the DDR our mats are fine, but what if I want to draw instead of dance, and I want this to be a drawing tablet instead of a dancing mat? I'm so lucky this exists. The You Draw Game Tablet, created by THQ. You'd pop a Wii Remote in, and boom, we can finally play You Draw Studio. I was always wondering why you couldn't play this. Y you need a tablet for it. So here's the thing. For what it is, You Draw functions fine enough, it does in fact work, but not well enough for Wacom to grit their teeth. Left-handed people are a f***ing sin to You Draw. This tablet was obviously designed with righties in mind. You use the Wii Remote buttons to control certain elements, while the style is on the right-hand side of the device attached by a cord shorter than the list of Wii Speak compatible games. 
The included software is just a simple art program, and there's loads of things to do here, like boot it up, draw a horse, the possibilities are endless. You can also play Pictionary. Guess what word I'm drawing? That's right, arrows. This is all right, but it's not anywhere close to as precise as actual drawing tablets. And while THQ tried to showcase how this can be used for actual art, to me, this is nothing more than a toy. THQ released a handful of UDraw required games and also brought the accessory over to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. This is what killed them. Banking on an art accessory for three systems when you're best known for WWE games. I don't know what they were thinking with this one. Nobody goes to THQ for advice. Why did they think they can make this? See, THQ was never really, in my eyes, a big or quality enough company to truly make an accessory like this and for it to be successful. So I'll follow that statement up with a sentence I find myself ending everything with these days. What about Ubisoft? Did anybody know this was a thing? The Drawsome Tablet, released about a year after UDraw, was a drawing tablet by Ubisoft. I have never heard of this thing before. It's fundamentally the exact same thing as UDraw, but we have two games bundled in for the price of one, Smurfart and not Smurfart. Popping the game in? Where's the stylus? So my tablet didn't come with a stylus. See, I thought the core length of UDraw was a negative, but hey, at least the stylus can't be lost this way. I bought this used and it did not come with a pen, and I also can't use a UDraw tablet to control draw some games. I know, humanity just can't win. But Sketch Quest is playable with just a Wii remote. This is a good time to move on to guns. So the Wii Zapper always looked more like a cousin of a gun rather than an actual gun, so if you wanted a more realistic take, I wouldn't blame you. The Nyko Perfect Shot feels fairly solid. You have a port for the nunchuck at the bottom. Yep, I feel like shooting. But if you need a Wii gun, this is one of your best bets. Because other than the Perfect Shot, we have this. Two blasters plus game. Nintendo gave their blessing to these. This was an interesting proposition. You'd get two Wii Remote guns and a free downloadable WiiWare game. Big Town Shootout. So we have to go to PDP's website to get a download code for it. Okay, let's at least try to input this code into the Wii Shop channel. Alright, let's open up a WiiWare game I have that involves killing. These are very bizarre. We take the battery cover off the Wii Remote, the gun inserts on the back instead, and it took me a while to realize they then want you to put the battery cover on the side of the gun. For the longest time, I just assumed this was how it looked. I mean, sure, this way, it's pretty well attached, but... I didn't really think that was a problem with any other Wii guns I've used. Like the Nerf gun, bundled in with the Nerf Endstrike games. It's fine. You can also use it as an actual Nerf gun if you're just dying to prove to everybody you bought Nerf and Strike. But here we have the big boy, the Cabela's Big Game Hunter accessory. This is about as complicated as a Wii Zapper, but this feels much more like an actual gun. There's even a crosshair that you can sync up with the game so you can use it to aim down sights. All right, it's time to shoot whatever comes up. And I have the exact same problem with this as I did with the Wii Zapper. I just don't like moving this entire thing around compared to being able to freely move the Wii Remote and Nunchuck separately. Out of all these guns, I probably just prefer playing with the controllers by themselves, but if I had to choose one, the blasters felt the best. What the f*** am I saying? Well, like most aspiring parents, the only reasonable thing to do after critiquing a gun is raise a child. Babysitting Mama, a spin-off of Cooking Mama. This one's all about not shaking the baby. We have this plush doll we slide our Wii Remote in, and then we plug a nunchuck into the baby's back. Fundamentally, we hold the child in one hand, and then control various things with the nunchuck. It's all just a handful of minigames revolving around babysitting, rocking the baby to sleep, feeding it, all that. It is very pushy about not shaking the baby, that's a worthy cause, but it also actively encourages Wii Remote implants. But is this really what you think of when Wii accessories are brought up? Of course not, bring in the landfill. Many companies looked at the Wii wheel and said, people buy anything. Various accessories were put out that really add to the realism of Wii Sports, like how this turns your Wii Remote into a two inch tall baseball bat and you and your friend can play baseball using two baseball bats. It just works. I have yet to find a plastic add-on for the Wii Remote like this that actually adds to the game. These are all completely worthless. All these do is allow you to say, look ma, I'm stupid. A skateboard add-on for the Wii balance board? Hell yeah. If people ever ask me if I skate, now I have to pause a bit before I answer. Boxing gloves. These are basically just gloves that have cut out for the Wii Remote and Nunchuck. Yeah, if you ever get into a fight, hide a Wii Remote in your glove. An airplane controller. I have no game that would work with this in the sense that you use both the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, so this is just a very static way to play Wii Sports Boxing. The bowling ball. You pop a Wii Remote in here and play bowling. Dear God, don't let go of it. What's the point then? Does this really feel more like bowling than just using a Wii Remote by itself? What the f***? 
f*** is the point of a golf club add-on if it's just a stubby as top to your Wii remote? This doesn't feel more like a golf club, it just feels like I'm living a lie! What's the point of having these add-ons? They don't matter! The wheel I get because it makes the Wii remote feel more like a wheel, but the ping pong paddle during gameplay, I don't feel the core part that makes this feel like a ping pong paddle. What's the point? I'm not a fan, but we do have various other accessories to go over, like the cyber bike. It was an exercise bike that would plug into the GameCube ports and it only worked with one game and is pretty rare. I don't have the bike, but I do have the game and I thought that would make me happy. Maracas, darts, dumbbells, pretty much every form of concrete matter in existence has been transformed into a Wii remote at some point. Clearly, I can't include every single thing made for the platform. Maybe someday we can pick this subject back up, but for now, I think I've covered a good chunk of all major accessories. Once I mentioned the car adapter. Oh, of course, we can't forget about the Wii Remote charging stands. I personally never owned one because I love to support and collect for Duracell batteries. I still have my first Duracells from when I was a kid. And in addition to that, my skin cannot get enough of battery corrosion. Hey all, Scott here. It's just not enough. I need more! I want people to look through my window and see a bunch of garbage and say, that looks like a fun house to break into. So I was shifting between two options. I was thinking my first accessory to nab would be a, a window but this one had deal or no deal. This is the Nintendo DS, and this is the Nintendo DS now. Handheld gaming has always been Nintendo's sweet spot. They're home consoles, they simply don't believe in roofs. The Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Nintendo 3DS, and Nintendo Switch, all incredible successes in their own special ways. But right in the middle was the Nintendo DS, releasing in 2004. This was one of Nintendo's most triumphant accomplishments. And it showed they didn't even need three screens to do it. Dual screens, microphone, touch base, Game Boy Advance compatible, it was everyone's dream. And the game library really struck a great balance between hardcore and casual titles, which was something that the Wii attempted. It was fruitless. With a full suite of buttons and the bottom touch screen being incredibly useful in many cases, more hardcore titles didn't feel completely out of place here. On the Wii, the more hardcore titles, their entire gimmick was, I'm a hardcore title on the Wii. Like, but the Wii was a phenomenon, selling over 100 million units. I personally always considered that to be the more popular system. Or at least it felt like it at the time. Now, you see, everybody owned a Wii. Everybody owned a DS. And four of them. 150 million plus sold. That is insane. One of the best selling platforms of all time. Of course, being a portable unit with four revisions definitely helped that number. The whole family can share a Wii, but each member needs a DS for every finger. I personally owned a white Nintendo DS Lite and went out of my way to ensure I got the DSi. So I can at the very least confirm, while the DS family sold 150 million plus, subtract one from the user count. The long and short of it is, the Nintendo DS was a monumental success, even during the Wii's generation where that felt like the big deal, the DS ended up being 50% more of a big deal. And if the Wii had all these accessories and plastic add-ons made for it, Run. The absolute nerve of Nintendo not including all this in the product at launch. The Nintendo DS had a lot of potential for add-ons. You can't look at this hole and not fill it. Look, oh my god, you could add anything here. Footrest. But we can't start talking about accessories until we talk about accessories, and first one up, my college thesis. Almost as notable as the inclusion of two screens was the Nintendo DS's touchscreen. The bottom one here was susceptible to abuse. This was the touchscreen. Unlike modern ones, it wasn't multi-touch and required more precise input, which is why using a bowling ball just didn't work. You could use your fingers, but the screen worked best with a smaller input, which is where the DS stylus comes into play. This may look like something that cleans your teeth, but it is Luigi compatible. So many kids lost theirs, but it didn't matter. This screen will accept damn near any form of input run. But the traditional stylus still worked the best, which is why Nintendo liked to include extra stylus I. Didn't help things. The stylus industry blew up in the late 2000s. Replacement pens were constantly sold, different colors, sizes, but the issue is, each iteration of the DS had a different stylus design. The entire point of using an official DS stylus is then you can fit it back in its cubby. So if you buy a replacement stylus pack and it doesn't fit your specific model or you went a little too wild and bought the giant DS pen, well at that point you might as well use a dull pencil. Yeah, there's this pen-like stylus release that clicked in and out. Why not always leave it clicked out? I must preserve the plastic. The final DS iteration, the Nintendo DSi XL, came bundled with a fountain pen stylus. The entire point of this model was to appeal to the elderly. And they love 
pens. This is obviously the most comfortable stylus as it's shaped and sized exactly like a real man's pen. Since the DSi XL was so big and named at Crosswords DS users, having a big extra pen here it made sense as it wasn't intended as the most portable unit. This feels more at home just on a nightstand or something. I didn't realize until now how each DS had a different stylus design, but that's not nearly as egregious as the different chargers. I had to take a night class for this. Okay, so the original Nintendo DS has the same charger as the Game Boy Advance SP, which is a different charger from the Game Boy Micro, which came after the original DS, but before the DS Lite. Where the DS Lite had a new charger specific only to it, then the DSi had its own charger that didn't work with the original DS or DS Lite, and this charger was used for the DSi XL, the 3DS, 3DS XL, 2DS, new 3DS, new 3DS XL, and new 2DS XL. So the DS Lite has a charger that no other being can accept. They made up for it with the slot 2 pack. The original DS and DS Lite were compatible with Game Boy Advance cartridges. Not original Game Boy, they aren't God. The Nintendo DS Lite was supposed to be actually presentable though, so they included this little filler piece to make the design look more flush. While I didn't ever lose the stylus, I definitely lost this little piece as it was completely unnecessary. It didn't do anything except make you feel better about yourself. Like what if people see me on the train? The main reason I pitched this was so then I could just plug whatever in the slot whenever I wanted. In which this is the place the most iconic DS accessories called home. This slot, on top of giving us the ability to play Game Boy Advance games, completely revolutionized handheld peripherals. You couldn't do this kind of stuff on the PSP, like the memory expansion pack. F*** you, Sony. This was bundled with the Nintendo DS browser, and what I have here is the DS Lite version. This one will work on the original DS model. For that, you had to go to Nintendo's online shop. Weirdly enough, though, the original DS model's expansion pack works on the DS Lite, but the DS Lite version doesn't work on the original DS, so why wouldn't they just release the original version in stores that works for both? It's because the Nintendo DS browser had no reason to give a sh**. Accessories that use the Game Boy Advance slot, or slot 2 as Congress calls it, are called DS Option Packs and expand the world of DS software to include Wikipedia. The memory expansion pack is required for the browser and very little else. Zero can be little. Yeah, this was only used for this title specifically, because the DS can't run a web browser all on its own. We asked too much of it. So why not tackle something a bit more useful? The Rumble Pack. This is a full-on throwback to the Nintendo 64, where it too had a Rumble Pack, allowing for supported games to feel the power of a seizure. Some Game Boy Color and Advance titles had built-in Rumble features, but of course that cost more to manufacture. You had to design a cartridge around that kind of thing. With the DS, having an optional separate accessory meant more games could theoretically support it, like Picross DS. It's like I'm really there! Roughly. 50 games supported the Rumble Pack, and most of them were released from 2005 to 2007. I think many developers and publishers realized most people weren't getting enough out of Rumble in these games to warrant plugging it in slot 2, so why bother even supporting it? But the Rumble is more impressive than I expected though. It's fairly nuanced, kind of like the HD Rumble in the Nintendo Switch controllers. It's not going to blow your mind, but it's a fairly detailed little Rumble. It's a shame more games don't support it, though I completely understand as I'm not going to go out of my way to ever use this again. That's right, I'm taking a stand. If we're talking DS accessories the plug into slot 2 though, we gotta talk arthritis. This is one everybody remembers, even if you never owned it, the Guitar Hero Guitar Grip was THE DS accessory. Shows how much creativity developers had on the DS. How do we take Guitar Hero and put it on the platform without taking away everything that makes a Guitar Hero, i.e. the guitar? Well, you f up your wrist, that's how. Plugging this into the GBA slot and holding the DS on its side, we have a Guitar Hero game. Now with one less button. I can be pissed about that. It works incredibly well though. I'm just awful at Guitar Hero. My hand-eye coordination from Guitar Hero buttons to screen just never fully developed. But that doesn't take away from how special this device is. It even came with a guitar pick stylus that fits into the grip itself. This was a pretty popular title on the DS and spawned a few sequels, including Band Hero, which also used the guitar grip, but had a drum pad as well. This isn't nearly as endearing. It's a silicon sleeve you put your DS Lite into. God, these kind of cases always feel like somebody just wiped their nose with them. You slide it all on and you have drum pads. It works. It's kind of cute. Just not nearly as ingenious as the guitar grip, but a worthy attempt at playing drums on the go. And keep in mind, these accessories are made with the DS Lite in mind. The guitar grip requires this adapter to work on the original DS because of design differences, and the Band Hero drums just straight up won't work. And if you try to play with the guitar grip on the DSi or DSi XL, reality sets in. They removed the GBA slot, but included an SD card slot. And as a kid, I had an idea for a version of Guitar Hero on tour for the DSi that connected to that port. Still proud of that idea. To give the DSi credit, there were some games exclusive to it that wouldn't work on a DS Lite or DS, like games that use the cameras. But two games found a way, Face Training and 
face training. This game focuses on strengthening your facial muscles, giving you a tight smile. And the only way for it to accurately insult you is with a camera. The facing scan camera was only released in Japan and came bundled with face training alongside a stand for the DS. You can pop it on here sideways and use this thing on a desk more easily, and it's pretty surreal to see camera footage on a DS or DS Lite. It works across both models, even the original DS. Since the device fits flush with the model, you have a jump scare option. Face training was later released for the DSi in Europe, with no need for the facing scan. Still came with a stand for the system, though. But nothing will be the Magnetic Stand, released only in Japan. This was primarily marketed alongside games like Personal Trainer Cooking, due to the fact the magnets can turn any fridge into a smart fridge. The stand plugs into the GBA slot and holds the DS up that way. It's like somebody holding up by your nostrils. But yeah, you can set it up for at a table by opening up the bottom and adjusting the angle a bit. It comes with a dangling stylus. Your question was answered. But here's a similarly designed accessory, the Slide Controller, bundled with the Japan exclusive Slide Adventure Mag Kid. It receives power from slot two and turns your DS into a mouse. Nobody told them the definition of necessary. This is weird. So you move the DS around and control the character on screen as if the DS is a computer mouse, but the screen for the computer mouse is a computer mouse, and it works. The slide controller is one of the most bizarre things Nintendo has pushed out, just because of how seemingly unneeded it is. But it makes for an experience that can't really be replicated elsewhere. I mean, a computer, sure, but just moving the entire device around like a mouse makes this wholly unique. Speaking of motion-based gimmicks, Activision released a motion pack for the DS. This was a third-party accessory giving the DS some motion capabilities, specifically for Tony Hawk's motion. I moved the DS, I moved Tony Hawk in the game. It works okay, but at the end of the day, it just makes you want a real voodoo doll. Sega released a card reader that plugged into the slot, only in Japan, supporting just three titles. This is pretty much the same deal as Nintendo's e-reader for the Game Boy Advance, but even more useless. I don't have any of the games or cards for it, but if it's anything like the e-reader, run. The Easy Piano was a third-party accessory that turned your DS into like two ways of a piano. All right, here's the deal with this. This is a cute toy that is completely bundled and supported by the wrong game. Easy Piano is mostly a mini game collection just about music and when it does use the piano, it's like mostly just a noisemaker. It's kind of cool to hear piano noises from the DS after hitting some keys, but that's like kind of all there is to do with this thing. Rock Band 3, that featured keyboards as playable instruments. It got a DS version that used no accessories. This would have been perfect for that game, but no. Ever heard of a Greek tragedy? Well, now you have. Okay, that's fine. I mean, this is a dumb piano anyways. If you really want to learn piano, there are far better and more realistic options out there to do so with. So let's talk about a DS accessory with real world applications. I am of course talking about diabetes. The Bayer Digit Blood Glucose Meter plugs into the GBA slot. Naturally, it is a glucose meter after all. Now I couldn't get diabetes in time to discuss how this actually works, but I don't really need to. It reads your blood sugar levels and is designed to give kids with diabetes more incentive to read them more often. So alongside this device, you get a diabetes turn-based RPG, knock em down's world fair. You get power-ups in the game for checking your blood sugar levels. The GBA slot deserves an award. There's so much it can do, help with diabetes, put the DS on a fridge, f with Tony Hawk. We can even turn our GBA slot based devices into iPods with the Nintendo MP3 player. It's just a GBA cartridge, but it released during the DS's reign and mainly pushes them on the box. It's a cartridge with an SD card slot and headphone jack. You pop it in and you can play your media files this way. The name Nintendo MP3 player was a localization of the play Yen series of MP3 players Nintendo released for the Game Boy Advance only in Japan, with the Nintendo MP3 player only releasing in Europe. I would have killed for something like this back in the day. Just seeing video files play via games on the DS was mind-blowing. There were a handful more GBA slot-based accessories for the DS. Dido released a paddle controller, which is apparently incredible for games like Arkanoid, but I couldn't find one. I got the diabetes meter, leave me be. The last one I have here is the pedometer for my weight loss coach. It really makes you think, why don't most pedometers have this plug? It's interesting my weight loss coach comes with a pedometer while my stop smoking coach doesn't come with Nicorette. But it's just a pedometer. When you wear it, you have the audacity to flash the Ubisoft logo to everybody. So yeah, it's worth it. Ubisoft did a lot of these life help games during this era. I believe they stopped because they realized they weren't good at it. Developed with a professional nutritionist. Just one. But pedometers were a big deal on the Nintendo DS. It's probably why Nintendo built one into the Nintendo 3DS. They love health especially dog health. Personal Trainer Walking, part of the same series as Personal Trainer Cooking. You gotta burn it off somehow. This comes with the activity meter. Yes, you can track the dog's life rhythm. This game is pretty interesting because it actually includes its own meat creator from the Wii in the game, and the game cartridge itself is an infrared sensor. It actually concerned me when I saw it. I thought it was a bootleg since the cartridge is so much darker than usual. I never knew this is what the black market was like. Nah, it's darker because it's an IR sensor and it interacts with the activity meter this way. But did I mention you get two of them? Two activity meters, two clips, too hard. Much like my weight loss coach's pedometer, 
is a pedometer, though it is much slimmer and more discreet than Ubisoft's. Watch out, Fitbit. But the more well-known pedometer for the Nintendo DS was the Pokewalker. Bundled with Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, this was a pedometer that allowed you to take your Pokemon from the game for walks, which would open up in-game content based on how many steps you take. This is obviously a gimmick thrown in there to appease parents who were mortified at the fact their children weren't using their legs, so they put this out using the same IR technology as the activity meter. In the end, the Pokewalker ended up being one of the most accurate pedometers ever created at the time. Time. See, Nintendo was at their best when they have no reason to be. The Pokewalker was later repurposed for Wii Fit U. They used the exact same shell and technology, but one thing the Pokewalker has in comparison is that it can be misread as Pokewalker. Keeping track here. Speaking of Pokemon, here we have Learn with Pokemon. No! Learn with Pokemon Typing Adventure is an educational game for the Nintendo DS, only released in Europe and Japan. This title implies that other Pokemon educational games were intended to follow this, but you don't need further education as long as you can type Chimchar. This came with the Nintendo Wireless Keyboard, a very broad name for an accessory that only worked with this one title. It's a Bluetooth keyboard, which does mean you can use it on other devices, but the DS doesn't have Bluetooth, so they injected Bluetooth into the game cartridge. Just the different things they're willing to do to make things work on the DS amazes me. The game also comes with a stand for the DS, which is nice, but you can just set it up like a laptop on a desk, and that works perfectly fine. It's just a typing game. Type the Pokemon names, I may not know how to type any other words, but now Chimchar I can do blindfolded. After learning, it's time to go recreational, or in other words, Recreate. The Nintendo DS TV Tuner. Yeah, you could watch television on your DS. Only in Japan, but this isn't a new idea. Other handhelds have had TV tuners released for them, and portable TV sets have been a thing for decades. This would have been awesome when I had my DS Lite. I remember seeing one of my friends getting a smartphone that was able to receive digital TV signals, and they could watch f***ing Nickelodeon at the funeral. When I was a kid, the coolest thing ever would have been to watch TV wherever I wanted. In the backseat of a car at school, it was the coolest idea ever, and if I was was in Japan and wanted to be laughed at in public, it could have been a reality. This doesn't work here. But if I was in Japan in 2007, it might have. Even if no signal comes in, it's a really cool nugget of Nintendo history. Just seeing the software, it feels right at home with other Nintendo products at the time. So this one's pretty fun. A calligraphy pen for the game Calligraphy Training, only released in Japan. This game teaches how to properly write out kanji because it ain't easy. Like what, that's not a box? It's all in the amount of brush strokes you use. And with the regular DS stylus, you can play it but it defeats the purpose of the title. It's genuinely here to teach proper calligraphy, so the included pen, while nothing special, it's literally just a longer stylus modeled after a brush, it definitely helps. The feeling of writing in this game feels uncanny. It's so natural, but what if they went a bit further? What if it supported the rumble pack? I'll stay out of politics. There's another stylus alternative on the DS, the thumb strap. And so it comes to this. The DS had a few 3D titles on it, but just a single D-pad. So to make these games feel more natural, Nintendo would implement touchscreen controls. But to make them feel even more natural, they included this wrist strap with the original model. It has this little piece of plastic at the end. You wrap it around your thumb and you have Nintendo's answer to having no analog stick. They could have just put in an analog stick. You got all this trouble to make up for the lack of a stick, which just makes me ask, why didn't you just add a stick? I refuse to take baths, I instead bathe in body spray. Now there was a third party stylus in the works called the Smart Stylus by PDP. I don't think this ever released. Rather, it was only shown to the press and was more so a tech demo. It would connect to an adapter plugged into the GBA slot and would allow for the stylus to rumble and light up and play sounds based on the game being played. It was supposed to be bundled with the game Squee Balls. And? I don't think it was. A game called Squee Balls Party was released and there was a bundle containing a stylus, but it wasn't the smart stylus, which leads me to believe this never came out. There's the direction sensor card, which who the hell knows what this is? This was probably going to be a first party peripheral or a variant of the Nintendo DS game card that could track motion. I believe it was used for this stargazing application, but that never released here in North America. At least a headset did. The Nintendo DS headset. That's right. Nintendo basically refused to make a wireless headset for any game console except the DS. You could use this with Pokemon and Brain Age. You do math like a bitch. Yeah, so very few games actually use this for voice chat. Games like Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, Metroid Prime Hunters, Advance Wars Days of Ruin, but you could use it as just a regular microphone for games that simply use the microphone. I personally feel like this is a fairly pointless accessory. It's not like there were a ton of voice chat enabled games anyways, and even then, they pretty much all just used the built-in mic, which yeah, that's gonna be worse. But who the hell was expecting DS voice chat to be good in the first place? Here we have a cleaning kit. This helps us get dust and grime out of both cartridge slots. Me personally, I'm okay. I have a tub. Screen protectors, yep, you need those, especially for the bottom screen. Uh, but I never really was a big screen protector guy. I don't know, I consider any scratches to have stories behind them. Uh, this was when I was a jackass. This was just when I was a fucking idiot. Some accessories had both Wii and DS branding, like the official Wi-Fi USB connector and some SD cards, which, yeah, branded SD cards, so everybody can see you have an official Nintendo SD card. 
when it's always going to be inside the system. Well, that's pretty much most of the Nintendo DS accessories ever released. Or at least the first 10% of them. Starter packs, pretty much any combination of case, stylus, game cart container, charger you can possibly think of. They were sold and usually endorsed and licensed by Nintendo. Like the starter kit. Or the starter kit. Or the starter kit. Or the essentials kit. Or the essential kit. Character-based accessories for if the TV tuner wasn't enough for bullies. Game card storage units. These hold one each will ensure you don't lose your game cards. They're the same size as one. Stylus packs? Crayola! These support the claims that crayons can do anything. Game and go kits for when you really need a case, but you really need Howie Mandel. There are so many accessory packs, and they're all pretty much variations of the exact same thing. Value pack. Okay, so the stylus is longer than my leg. Six game card cases. Each of them hold only one each, so does this really help me travel with them? Does this help me travel with multiple at once? Each of these can only hold one game card each. Does it stop me from swallowing them? No!